What's up investors, Sneer is here. One of the most important things I do when I research a new company is looking at their return ratios. Because the return ratios tell me how good the management and the company is in taking money, invested in creating whatever they create, and then getting a return for it. The return ratios are very effective to tell a story about a company as isolated entity, and of course compared to other companies in the same market and the same industry. Understanding how the return ratios are working is essential to use them well when researching a company. So the basis for return ratio is understanding the basic theory for companies. We look at a company that takes any capital in, equity, debt, or any other way, and then employs this capital to create something. Let's say we, we took uh, $100,000 in equity from an investor, and it invested in some factory or some machine that creates an income. Then this income can be either paid back through dividends, share buybacks, or things like that, or it can be reinvested and create more income. The ratios we want to look at is depending on the capital we got in, the assets we bought with this capital, how much money it generated for us, the investors, and by that measure how well the company does. So the first ratio I want to look at is return on assets. Return on asset is calculated by taking the income divided by the asset. Now in this case, it's typically used the net income minus the dividends if they are existed and minus the taxes. And that depends specifically on the scenario. There are some people who calculate the return on asset with the taxes. We will get to that. Just in the general picture, we get the net income and it's divided by all the assets. Hey guys, Sneer from the edit room here. The screen you see says that assets include equity, which is wrong. Only if the entire equity was used to buy assets, then it's equal to the equity as well, but it's not necessarily the case. So let's look at two simplistic examples. Let's say we have a company that is heavy in capital. It's a company that has to buy a lot of machines to create whatever we want to create. So they bought the machine, it's a heavy machine, it costs $100,000, and this machine generates $5,000 in income. So in this case, we have a 5% return on asset. Now let's go to something that is capital light. And in the case of capital light, we got $100,000 in assets and they generated a $25,000 in income. They were able to generate more income for this capital because the operation is capital light. You don't need heavy machinery that costs a lot of money. You could use, let's say this is a software company that can use just basic laptops and then laptops you can buy for $100,000 and some uh, cloud servers, then able to employ a lot more programmers that create more income from this capital. So in this case, in the capital light case, you've got 25% return on assets. Now, if we look at it like that, at a very simplistic way of return on assets, it's obvious that getting a 25% return is much better than 5%. But this does not tell the entire story. And that's the important thing about return ratios, to understand the story. Because a capital heavy company typically is able to take loans, to take debt against their investment because their investment is mostly tangible. Whereas for capital light companies like software company, it's harder to take debt because if they default on their debt, usually the debtor is not able to sell their, the assets. So for that case, we have return on equity and return on equity is similar to return on assets. But in this case, instead of getting just the assets, we remove the debt. So let's take the same example as we had before for capital heavy and capital light. As I said, in capital heavy industry, the debtor is more confident in giving loans to such company. 
So in this case, this company got $80,000 in loan and we got $100,000 in assets. So in this case, because we removed the, the debt, we got $20,000 here, still the same income of $5,000. And because of the high leverage we got in this case, the return on equity looks much better. Now it's 25%. And in the capital light case, we just been able to get $10,000 in debt. So we got $90,000 in the capital light equity total without the debt. And then we got 27% return on equity. It's still better in our example, but it's far less obvious 25% to 27% compared to five and 25%. Warren Buffett famously said that return on equity is his favorite return ratio. And the reason for that in this case, what we see here, it's because it shows us a better picture of the management. Of course, in terms of what we checked, that the balance sheet is clean and that the debt is not excessive because you can take a lot of debt just to make your return on equity look good. So we need to be aware of that, but given that the debt is not excessive and the debt is taken in terms that is good for us, the investor is good for the company, low interest rate, all the conditions are good, then in this case, it means that if you have a high return on equity, the management is able to manage the finance of the company. It's able to leverage through debt a lot of its operations to get more returns for the owners, for the shareholders, without taking more money directly from the shareholders. And then through the reinvestment and through the returns, pay the debt in time. So they are able to generate a lot more than they were without the debt. Now let's take a look at two real world examples to get a sense on what these return ratios mean and how it's implied in reality. First, let's look at Google. Google is obviously a capital light company as being a software company. And so we want to see here in the financials, let's take a look at the net income. So we can see that the net income is growing and growing really fast. Whereas if we take a look at the balance sheet for the assets, the total assets, we can see that it is growing, but not as fast because Google not as capital heavy again. And then let's look at the ratios. So we can see that the return on assets for Google, it's growing steadily, but 8%, 8 to 9% typically. And in the past year, it's risen to 15%. Now, the interesting thing here is the return on equity because the return on equity is much better, but not massively better. We will take a look soon at a capital heavy company but it's typically two times than the return on asset for Google in this case. Now let's take a look at a capital heavy company. In this case, I chose Verizon. Verizon is a telecom company that needs to buy a lot of machinery to service their customers. So let's look at their financials. So we can see here at the net income, a steady growth, not as much as Google, obviously. And then let's look at their total assets at the period. We can see that their total assets are growing much faster while their liabilities is fairly steady. It's growing, but it's fairly steady. Now let's like take a look at the ratios. We can see that here that the return on asset is around 7%. It got a bit lower recently to 5%. But when we look at the return on equity in comparison, we can see here 65%, 88 0.9%, 32%. That's a lot more than their return on assets. Now, obviously, because they are a capital heavy company, they leverage a lot of debt to get a lot of returns. So we can see the difference here. And so for this kind of company, it's better to look at the return on equity rather than the return on asset because they employ a lot of debt to get a lot of tangible asset that when they immediately use with their customers to generate revenue. Now let's look at the different things we can assign to this ratio. So when we talk about the income, for example, it can be the net income as we used right now. It can be the earnings before interest and taxes for some cases, and it can be the net operating profit after tax, the NOPAT as it's called. 
And this, for example, the notepad is used when we talk about return on invested capital. Now, why would we want to consider different incomes? And every investor is calculating this in a different way to the way that he prefers depending on the scenario. Let's talk, for example, about any insurance company. Think, if you want, about Berkshire Hathaway. The insurance company, because they have a lot of money, any financial company, banks do that as well, they have this money which they can then invest and generate more money from their investment. Now, this investment is not part of their operation. If we want to measure the operations of a company, then we need to use the net operating profits instead of the net income. Another thing that comes to mind is Tesla with their investment in Bitcoin that Elon Musk did and generated a lot more money. Now, if you want to measure Tesla with, without this one-time thing, you want to measure Tesla operation, then you need to take the operating profits and you need to adjust the ratios and you need and you then need to adjust how you compare to other companies when you analyze Tesla. Next, we want to define what is the capital, as we see here at the bottom line of the ratio. As we saw, we can have assets, which gives us return on assets, equity. Then we have invested capital and employed capital. Now, I don't want to get into these definitions now. You can find a lot of calculations of it in the internet. But be warned, every person they see is calculating it a bit differently. And these variations, what they do is they give you a better picture for some companies where the ratios are more fit. Maybe I will get to it in a follow-up video, so subscribe to that. The last thing I want to talk about is when we see the ratios, we have a few concerns. The first concern is cash holdings. Because if we look at return on assets, let's go to Google, for example, and we can see here at the balance sheet, we've got the, the assets here and most of the assets, it's just cash, cash laying around for years. We've got almost 130, 140 billion dollars in cash that we are just waiting to employ. And this cash is not generating any new income. So laying around waiting for an opportunity to be invested, maybe buying a new company or something like that is all fine, but it doesn't represent, if we use it simply as that, it doesn't represent the ability of Google to take some amount of money and generate more money for me. The next concern I have here is scaling growth companies. A lot of companies today, especially in the day of tech and uh, blitz scaling and all these kind of things, they don't generate money for a lot of time. And one example I want to look at is Uber. Uber is still a losing company. They have grown massively. You can see here in the revenues from 3 billion at 2016 to 21 billion in the last 12 months. That's a massive growth. Yet they are still a losing company. We can see here in the net income, they are losing billions every year. Now, when we will assign losing money into the ratios, you can see it here, we will obviously get return on asset and return on equity in negative terms. Minus 77% return on equity, minus almost 20% return on asset. Now, does that mean it's a failing company? No, not really. Uber is a company that tries to employ a lot of cash fast to take control on massive amount of the market so that when they will be able to rise prices and go to profitability, they will have a total pricing control in every market. So in this kind of investment, return ratios really tells us nothing. So we need to consider that when we analyze any companies. So guys, that's it for today. I hope this video was helpful. If it was valuable to you, leave a like and subscribe and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.